the sermon series that was dealing with new year, new me, new us, together. Now, normally, a lot of times when it turns, the calendar turns to the next year, we always ask the one question, what am I going to do? What is my resolution going to be? What things am I going to change or add or subtract from my life that will make me better? And honestly, I think this is something I've asked of myself because every year everyone does the same thing time and time again, but I think it's the wrong question. I think the question that I need to ask myself, that we need to ask ourselves right now is, who will I be? Because we always want to jump to step 10 and say, well, how can I stop this behavior or pick up this discipline or whatever it may be? But we don't really focus on the change of who we are in the process. And a lot of times, even in church, you see people who have grown up in the faith or been in it for so long, we think we've learned everything there is to learn and know everything there is to know about Christ in Christ. So we get complacent and bored. What Jesus says is, I want you to be like me. I'm not trying to strip all the things about you that are good and make you into a carbon copy of someone else. I want to make you more than you are, but it's you uniquely and distinctly. But a lot of times we lose that focus. We don't ask, who am I going to be this year, today, tomorrow, and how is that going to change and grow and impact forever this side of eternity? We always say, well, what am I going to do? Now, I'm not saying disciplines are bad. But sometimes just focusing on the action is never enough. Case in point, every year at every gym in every city across the planet, January is full of people. January 5th, a couple less people. January 30th, you've got people sign up to three-year contracts that are going to pay for that gym membership and never step inside the door again. Because all they did was focus on what can I do and... That just didn't last, it didn't sustain, it didn't have any lasting impact. But the problem is when we take that approach to our faith especially, it doesn't last. Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 10, starting at the 38th verse. Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, I want to stop there for a second because this is very common practice. If you don't understand the cultural background, we won't understand why this woman, Martha and Mary, who we do know are the sisters of Lazarus, who has a very important part in the Gospels, uh, even have this initial contact with Jesus. Why would Martha open up her home to some wandering rabbi and his 12 companions? Because that's what she did. Culturally, remember, in that day and age, if you were a rabbi, you would be identified as a rabbi because of the following of people you had behind you. It's not just a guy leading a group of people, but it was distinguishable enough by the way that they even moved because a disciple, a student, would follow so closely in the footsteps of the rabbi or teacher, they would mimic every movement, every mannerism, physically, emotionally, motivationally, as best they could. And they would mimic him completely. It would be like a bunch of mimes walking in unison down the road. So you'd be able to pick this person out. And culturally, it was expected that since rabbis had nothing, if they were traveling, that you would open up your home as a gracious gift to try and bless them and all of their companions. So there's Martha, takes an opportunity. She says, hey, there's a rabbi right there, and he's got 12 people with him. Let's open up my home to this bunch of strangers, and let's just feed them, let them hang out here. That is why this is happening. Had Martha not chosen the opportunity, I don't know we would have had the connection of Mary or Lazarus at all. There wouldn't be any relationship. But she chose to take that opportunity. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations they had to do. She came to him, him being Jesus, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. You know, and a lot of times when you read this scripture, a lot of times I've heard it preached, you know, it's a simple comparison of, well, Mary chose what's better because she was with Christ and Martha was focused on the task at hand. It is so much deeper than that. And here's the thing. Martha didn't do something wrong. Okay, Jesus doesn't rebuke her and say, well, you stupid woman, you should have blah, 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 blah. It's so much deeper. And if you will just bear with me, let me get into my teaching mode here. Because every time Scripture specifies something that happened or a name or a place, it's with the intention 
of the audience reading it that especially back in the day 2,000 years ago if you were a Jewish person you would totally get what is not being said because it didn't have to be said because it was so culturally understood of the relevance of what's going on check am I still there? what just happened? technology I'll tell you So there's a reason. In verse 39 it says, here's Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet. And by comparison, Martha was doing things. Let me say this. Martha was not upset because Mary didn't help her in the sense of it's just as simple as not taking the action to help her sister. That's not the problem here. Martha is upset because Mary's behaving as if she were a man. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well, in the Jewish custom, in the Jewish homes, in any home of a Jewish man and woman who were married, they had different spaces where men could go and women could not go. Women could go in the kitchen. Men could go in the social area to gather and socialize together. The only time women were permitted to be in the same social space as the men was if they were eating or if they were in the bedchambers together. And if I have to explain to you why that would be, then we need another sermon series, okay? Or if their kids were playing outside, that was also okay. And it wasn't supposed to be this oppressive thing. It was supposed to be a dividing thing so that both people could live a fuller life together. That's the whole intention of the Jewish culture in this way. But when Mary leaves her sister from the kitchen where she is permitted and culturally obligated to be and chooses to sit at the feet of Christ, something so impactful here is happening that it goes off like an atom bomb to everyone who's reading this that understands the culture, and it absolutely changes things because she steps across an invisible barrier that she's not permitted to be. And she does it without hesitation. It's so interesting as to why and what is her thought process, what is going on here, because you see, to sit at the feet of a teacher, which is Jesus, because he is a rabbi, it was the domain that belonged to men only. You lived in a culture of people who were studying under rabbis, and they sought these teachers as the ultimate examples of the character of God, teaching the ways of God and the scriptures of God to men only. Women would be fed the leftovers as they absorbed from afar through their husbands the teachings of God. Mary said, that's not enough for me. It's not enough to be separated and divided because of social structures or cultural divisions. See, she wasn't focused on what she be, was told she should be doing. She was focused on, I know who I want to be, and I need to go to the source of that knowledge. See, it's also interesting is that when people sat at the feet of their teacher and their rabbi, it was listening and learning and focusing on the teacher as a master. And there's Mary with this picture of sitting with all these men. And you can only imagine what the men were murmuring to each other under their breath as this woman dared enter their presence and the presence of the one person they valued more than anybody else. And she didn't care. But taking that a step further, to sit with your rabbi as he instructed and taught. Because you know what scripture doesn't say is that Jesus stopped the lesson, which would have been culturally expected as well. He continued. He allowed it, and his lack of saying anything against her spoke louder to his disciples for the ministry in which he was here for. Jesus wasn't just here for the select few. Jesus was here for any who dared come. But to sit at the feet of Jesus meant that you not only studied and learned about what that teacher or that rabbi had to say, but it also meant that you desired to become a teacher yourself. And the only reason a person did so was to become a rabbi themselves. So you've got this woman, two women, first encounter with Christ, first woman sees an opportunity and invites Jesus into their presence. 
and does everything right to serve and bless Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. It is, is organizing all the things that she is expected to do as a woman in that culture in that day and time. Her sister, though, a little bit more rambunctious and impulsive, probably doesn't like being told what to do, chooses a different path, forever setting the course of Jesus' ministry on a very different trajectory for everyone who heard tale of this story. See, the whole impact and the point of this is you've got someone who shouldn't have been there going there, which takes a lot of cojones and a lot of guts to take the ridicule and the rebuke, to step across social and cultural lines that were inappropriate, that you were going to be belittled, and then to be received by Christ and to be taught by Christ as his empowering of her decision. See, that's not recorded in the scripture because people who read this would already understand that. If Jesus is saying, listen, you've been put here and have been confined by this for so long, but you chose something different, I will bless and honor that choice because you came to me. He's saying, do not be confined by the things of this life in your culture. Do not be confined by things or limitations, even in your faith, that maybe other people have tried to place upon you. It amazes me. How easy it is in the human condition, being a human being who is broken and imperfect, which we all are, don't have to take inventory because we're all in the same boat, redeemed by Christ, saved by grace through faith in Christ, but still have that element of that human brokenness. And when someone comes along our path, and I'm speaking for myself first and foremost, and you see them doing something that's so wrong, and the first thought I have is they should know better. And I'm not careful to lift that person up with love and grace and say, Lord, I pray that you can help me support and love this person. I instinctively take the opposite side of that coin and I start to even just not quite condemn, but that would not be a stretch from afar. Oh, that person's a total screw up. I'm way better than that person. That person's two steps from becoming like Hitler. We start to do these horrible things and have these different types of methods and approaches to people that really start to compartmentalize and distance and just push them away. But much like Mary, I grew up in different things. I grew up in a setting and I've served in settings where I was so eager to serve people that I would do anything and I would, I would give anything just to be able to serve those people. And that, that was good motivation, but I, I took it and I applied it in the wrong way. And I compromised everything that I was, and I lost myself in ministry. And it led to a breakdown, it led to a loss of identity, it led to depression, and all the stuff that we've talked about, that I've talked about for the last few years that I've been here. Because I let go of who God made me to try and serve others, which actually turned into appeasement of others, which actually turned into becoming under others, separated, compartmentalized. See, the thing is, we're all unique people. Jesus allowed and empowered Mary to come as she was. He didn't turn her away. She shouldn't have been there by cultural standards, by religious standards of the day. She shouldn't have been there, but there was something different that she knew from the moment that she saw Jesus. That she had to get to him no matter what. As she was, I just need to be with him because there's something so powerful about him. I not only want to hear about him, I want to be him in the world. It was this absolute statement of faith when everyone turned their back on her, her sister. The disciples were speaking against her, and Jesus, the only one who continued doing what he was doing, almost as if he didn't see it happening, which is a sign of this is okay. And then he starts to address it differently, you see. But in John 14, he says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. It's exactly what being a disciple was the expectation of in the first place. If you are a disciple of Christ, following Jesus, you're saying, whether you know it or not, I believe in God and I want to be a part of his ministry. And I not only can, but I will be because he will make it so. Verse 41, this is when it starts to get interesting. The conversation continues and Jesus answers Martha's concern. He says, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, which inevitably takes her focus off what is right. 
So I guess the question right now is, what is the thing that is distracting us the most? We're talking about becoming a, a new us, a growing, developing person of faith, uh, some, whatever it may be as you approach Jesus. What is it that distracts us? Or what is it that limits us? What is that wall of fear or doubt? Or maybe it's not even focusing on the right things. What is it that we've let go of that is distracting us? He says, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. He won't be taken away from her. And by saying something as simple as one thing is necessary, which is seeking after Christ, and it won't be taken away, he's not just saying it for her, he's saying it for everyone who has been marginalized, oppressed, and separated, beaten down and told you're not good enough. You won't accomplish anything. You're not good enough to be in this group or, or you're not doing enough to be a proper Christian. Everyone who's experienced any of that Jesus saying, that's a total lie because she has chosen what's better. She pushed past that and came to me because she knew who she wanted to be. And more importantly, she knew the one source that could actually make her into who she wanted to be that would affect everything that she would be doing. It was better for Mary to sit because she was placing herself in a position to be discipled. Galatians 3 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, there is nor male nor female, for you are all one Christ. Romans 8.29 says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined, became conformed to the image of his Son, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. This change in identity. It's one thing that's always kind of carried throughout Scripture. So I guess the final question is, what will I do? I will place myself at the feet of the one who makes me who I am to become. You know, and I know there's times where, we we'll probably talk about this every week, but things just don't go right. Things don't go the way you plan them. It's easy to come up and almost simplify situations and make them borderline black and white, but there's so much gray in everything. The main thing about this this morning is you've got Mary who's put in a very black and white situation as she steps right through the gray to Christ. See, but a lot of times it takes such courage and absolute certainty of I know who I'm going to to be able to do that in the first place, but we just don't. We do get distracted. Maybe we feel that our whole role is identified in our limitations, what we're told that we can and can't do, or who you are or are not to be. Yeah, but there's so many different stories of people who come to Jesus in their own way, which doesn't fit into anyone else's agenda or category, and it's beautiful. And I'm thankful for it, because those are the stories that bring such encouragement and hope. You know, and I'm, I'm thankful this morning as I even reached out to Iris this week as it was her birthday and she was celebrating. She told me it was one of the best birthdays she's had in a long time. They're the small blessings that can really change things. Perspectives. And when we say, you know, we start to look for different things and say, okay, Lord, just open my eyes to what I need to see. Show me who I am, make me who you want me to be. Things like that can start to take hold. So Lord, this morning I just ask that we can become like Mary to choose what's best. Lord, that we can ask the right questions of uh, who I will be rather than what I will simply do. Lord, because when we ask what will I do, it's about our control. God, but when we ask a question, who will I be, it takes it to a whole new level. Lord, and I pray as a community and individually, Lord, in this, this church that we will have the ability to choose what's right and what's best, to be able to draw closer to you, no matter what people say, no matter what things try and step in our way, that we'll just be able to get closer and closer, Lord, to be able to read the scripture and have new things revealed to us, the right things at the right time, because of your living spirit within us, God, to renew who we are, to regenerate, Lord, but to build up further than we've ever been. Lord, that you will take us places that we've never been able to go. 
that you will give us desires and passions and just give us a new sense of life and being made new as a new creation because that is who you are and that is what you've come to do. Lord, you've done a completed work on the cross. Let us not just live half-measured lives this side of it. Lord, make this church and this community who you want us to be. To become your hands and your feet, Lord. To not just have some sort of nice agenda that fits neatly into some sort of New Testament propaganda, God. But to actually have a connection with you individually and corporately. So just come, Lord, in Jesus' name.